Thanks, Rob. big team of people worked on Nemesis and your job was to ask the questions of the politicians. In a former life you were once the ABC's Middle East correspondent, some might say the perfect background to immerse in the internecine wars of the Liberal Party. Yeah, I, I think in fact with the, ne the Nemesis, Nemesis series, Lee, I think there possibly even more bloodshed uh, within the Liberal Party room, within the interviewing process, in the Cabinet room, in the Prime Minister's office. It was a fascinating project and as you said, a great team from across the ABC. We had people from Australian Story, Four Corners, the investigative unit, um, across a breadth of experience. And um, yes, it was a big project, but one I think that has shone a, a very interesting light on those nine years of coalition power. The very first thing you have to do on a big docuseries like this is persuade people to participate. Talk us through that process. That's right. Without participation, input, those people on camera, you've got nothing. So, look, the one thing the ABC has got is a pedigree in these political documentaries. We, we've gone back 30 years for Labor and Power on the Hawke Keating years, uh, the Howard years, and of course the killing season, Rudd Gillard Rudd. So, everyone knew what we're capable of. They knew we take it very seriously. We put a lot of time, effort and personnel into it. So, we put the shout out, a big group email to, I think it was over 150 people from that period. Um, we got some fairly immediate responses, uh, positive responses. Um, others we had to chase up. Um, a lot of the times we went and sat with people. We had a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and explained what we wanted to do. And we got the vast majority of the people we wanted to. Um, of course, Tony Abbott was probably the one that we were most disappointed didn't participate, but he had his own reasons. He did engage with us, he was polite, but I got a sense that he's still quite wounded over what happened to him. So when you are missing a key player like that, one of the three Prime Ministers of that period, how do you work around that? That's a good question. And, and Tony Abbott himself said, look, I don't want to take part, but why don't you use a lot of the archive you've got of me? And of course there is a lot of archive, but the other thing we did is we, we got people who were in the room with him, who were his loyal lieutenants and sometimes his disloyal lieutenants. And so we got a sense of Tony in episode one, and we've got people speaking from his perspective who defend his legacy, his record. And of course, we have the plotters as well. So you get a sense of history. And again, archive, we had plenty of archive of onion eating and the suppository of all wisdom. Um, so plenty to work with. Sometimes when you watch these things as a viewer, it's almost shocking how frank people are. What do you think motivates people to actually want to go on screen and talk so bluntly about their time in office? Yes, there's different motivations, clearly, for some people. Arthur Sinodinas, the former cabinet minister, said, I believe we have to learn from the mistakes we make and sometimes publicly discuss them. So he thought it was about learning from those mistakes. Um, other people, particular prime ministers, they want to defend a legacy, I think, and they have a lot of political skin in the game. And so they want to be part of it. They want to say why they took this decision or that decision. Others, I think, to be honest, they wanted to settle a few political scores too. And, and, and the series shows that there's still a lot of rancour and bitterness there. And um, there's still a lot of tribalism within that broad church. And so, yeah, we did see a lot of scores settled. Not everybody that you speak to ends up on camera. So how many people did you interview in total? Well, it was a process. We did over 90 what we call research interviews. Um, they, so we'd sit down with people, the little recorder, and sometimes three, four hours. Um, I, I, I stressed that it would be on the record. I didn't want to hear off the record stuff. I want to hear, if you come on, I want to hear what you're going to tell me. I want to be able to use that information to go to the other person in the room and say, such and such says, this is how it went down. What do you remember? From those 90, we got down to 60 key players. So from prime ministers, cabinet ministers, backbenchers, departmental secretaries, um, staffers. So over, I think it was 61 on-camera interviews in total, uh, you know, ranging from an hour, sometimes with some, to three hours with cabinet ministers, four hours, to up to eight hours with the prime ministers. One of the choices that we've made in the production of this show was that it would not have narration, that it's just put together using the actuality of what people said. What are the challenges of that style of storytelling? I think people thought we were insane to give that a go. Um, 
because obviously with a narrator you can knit things together you can okay that that grab of that person the Turnbull doesn't really fit next to that grab of Abbott or or Morrison that's where also the research interviews came in handy so I you know for example um, we talk about with Scott Morrison this rancorous phone call he had with Anastasia Palaszczuk during COVID about um, getting this young woman um, uh, you know, a pass to going to Queensland for her father's funeral. And, and Morrison told me his version of this phone call and how it went it was pretty bitter. And Palaszczuk told me her um, version of events and how she hung up on him at the end. So we knew both people's version of events. So when I structured the interview, I got them to explain and talk me through the phone call. And in the end, it was like they were, they were actually on the phone call, talking to each other. And we finished with Palaszczuk saying, and then I hung up on him. One of the notable stylistic devices of this program was the framing of the interviews. They had multiple cameras on them, but there was a particular shot that was used quite often, which you don't usually see on television, which was a profile of the talent position to either the far left or the right of the screen and quite a lot of negative space um, behind them. What was the purpose of that angle? That was the brainchild of our producer and director, Kyle Taylor, and with the help of uh, Ryan Sheridan, our cinematographer. And it was an interesting angle. It was a bit polarizing amongst the team about, do we like it or not? But Kyle wanted to give a sense of facial expression to get in their clothes. And as you see, what I thought from my perspective when I looked at it, it was almost like they're in a confessional. You're, you're almost like the priest. Oh, how <laughs> interesting. See, I look at it and I think, I feel like a knife's about to come in <laughs> at the back. Well, exactly, and Malcolm Turnbull says, you know, knives in the back, and he's literally, you're looking at him from behind almost to, to see where that knife's going to be plunged. And so it was an interesting um, way of using, as you say, negative space, but to, to really get into their facial features and to get a sense that you're listening to that confession. That's fascinating what you say about it being like a confessional, because I didn't consciously register that watching it but of course so often with all the visual devices that you use in television it's about triggering things in people's subconscious when they're watching. Yes that's right and um, I think the other thing too Lee is we wanted to give a sense of the individual and it's not often you know, if you look at a press conference and all the cameras are pointing sort of face on um, it might be a medium close up or it might be a bit tight but you never get that sense you're almost shoulder to shoulder with that person and you're seeing another literal side to them and figure uh, and metaphorical side as well. The interviews with the two Prime Ministers are, of course, the centrepieces of the second two programs. What was the preparation for that like and what was the vibe going into it at both ends, your end and their end? Look, the preparation was intense. Um, you know, with, with these men you're covering nine years, pretty much, and sometimes, you know, as you're setting it up while they're in opposition. So, oh, I think I read everything I could read, every book I could read about that period. I obviously... Um, I met both men and explained the project to them. Um, I got a sense that Turnbull obviously is keen to tell his side of the story and perhaps settle a few scores along the way. Uh, Morrison um, was interesting in that he did engage with us from the get-go. He was polite and he, um, he told me that he, yes, I was part of history. I think I can explain why things were done that way and I, I trust the ABC's documentary uh, storytelling style. So it, um, the research interview was interesting. I was, I was told by a very senior mentor of mine that I, I probably shouldn't do the research interviews with Turnbull and Morrison. We don't establish any sense of camaraderie, if you like, or rapport with them. Just ask your other members of the team to do that. So that when I go in and I sit with them, um, I'm almost a bit of an unknown factor for them as well. They're both obviously very seasoned media performers. Did you get a sense when they walked in on day one of, of any nerves? I, I did get a sense that this is a format that they don't often do, rarely do. Like, you know, to sit down for two days with the one person and rake over everything. And uh, they were good in that they didn't want to know ahead of time too much detail about where I was going to go or how I was going to frame the interview. Um, obviously, you've, you've, you've interviewed both men. Scott Morrison can be combative. Um, he's, he's very um, focused with his, with his media and obviously he likes to control the interview. They all do. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I let him talk at the beginning of his interview. And I think he found it unusual that he was this journalist just not saying anything, not interrupting. And, and he, he got into a rhythm. And that was good. And, and, and Turnbull was the same, you know, where I, I didn't interrupt. Um, 
only on a very extreme number of cases when I, I wanted some serious clarification um, and I thought a follow-up question was worth it. Where did you shoot those interviews and how were those choices made? We, we shot them all over the place. We, everything from Airbnbs to you know, the Royal Automobile Club to hotels, high-end hotels, um, homes. Um, the locations, we, we didn't want them to dictate the locations. We didn't want to go to their offices. Or we didn't want to go to Parliament House for obvious reasons that, you know, the bells could go off any minute and there's distractions of people running around. We wanted to own the space. And we also had up to four cameras and lights. So it took sometimes three hours just to set up. So um, we chose a, an array of uh, venues. Obviously for the Prime Ministers, we probably made it look a little magisterial. Um, then again, for someone like you know Queensland MP Luke Howth, we did it in an old Queenslander or and places like that. So we wanted to control the venue. Um, we wanted a place of silence and contemplation. And Parliament House, as I said, is not the place for that. How did the team come up with the title Nemesis? Well, that's a good question. Um, there was a lot of debate about the title. In fact, it took um, only until sort of a m couple of months before we were due to go to air that we came up with the title and. Um, I, I sort of like downfall and people were talking about unraveled or you know blue bloods and um, I think Nemesis um, it, it was a probably the winner for a number of reasons it just by its definition you know the agent of someone's downfall an arch enemy uh, retributive justice and I got a sense that it wasn't just the obvious foes here Abbott v Turnbull or or you know Morrison you know, v Turnbull as it turned out but it was also things like Turnbull and Barnaby Joyce saw the National Party up against the Liberal Party and there was a lot of conflict during that nine years but from a government that had come in after Rudd Gillard Rudd and said the adults are back in charge and they turned over more Prime Ministers than, than the Labor Party did. One of the really notable features of this series was the number of times in which politicians had entirely different recollections of very significant moments. Well, I was extremely disappointed and particularly that it wasn't made transparent to me and to, to others. I thought it was unnecessary. I thought it was an example of extreme overreach. You know, I apologise to Josh and we've, you know, we're reconnected and a, a, as good of friends as you could hope for. Um, and, and that's where we sit. It was, it was regrettable. And uh, so he, he knows I'm sorry about that. How did it damage your relationship with him when you heard about this? It impacted that relationship and still does to this day. So that was one example of that. There was plenty of others. There were a number that featured Matthias Corman. Sitting in the room with people as they were recounting these things, did you get the sense that people were lying or were there other reasons for the different takes on things? Yeah, look, that, that example was about the multiple ministries and Scott Morrison swearing him, himself in or getting himself sworn in as treasurer and not telling Josh Frydenberg, despite the fact they were both living at the lodge together at the time, they were, f they were flatmates, they were hanging out watching Yes Minister having a load of fun. And, and I was surprised. In fact, um, I, I interviewed Frydenberg before Morrison and, and Frydenberg was very clear their relationship had been damaged. And so when Scott Morrison told me that, I, I put back to him what Frydenberg told me and he, he said well no I, this is my reading of the, the situation and he stood by it. I had to leave the set after the interview and ring Josh Frydenberg and say uh, Mr Frydenberg uh, has your position changed towards Scott Morrison? He said no it hasn't. So you know people um, will have to make their own mind up about who's uh, telling the truth in some of these conversations and and Scott Morrison did make the point in another part of his interview you know people can go into the one room they can have a conversation or a discussion and go out with different ideas of what happened in there. Well, I wondered about, the, the one that I was thinking of was the one with Emmanuel Macron where and Morrison recounts where they had dinner together and, and there was this kind of awkward thing looming which was the AUKUS deal that was about to be announced. And it made me wonder, sometimes when you have an awkward conversation with someone, you, f you feel like you're being clear, but perhaps you're not being as clear as you might think you're being. And so the two parties may not necessarily be lying but they certainly walk away with different takes on what transpired. They certainly do and that Macron, um, uh, the Elise Palace, that dinner that they had together, Scott Morrison was very clear in that interview, I had to be very careful with my language. I didn't want to tell him that we'd done the deal with the Americans and the British because we hadn't, um, so I had to be very careful and 
politicians are very careful with their words sometimes and um, sometimes they're deliberately careful if you know what I mean it's and so you've got to distill it all and and that particular example Morrison goes into quite a bit of detail about why he thought he delivered the message without using certain words but obviously President Macron was not convinced <laughs> he did not get the get the message episode three opens with many of Scott Morrison's colleagues sharing different words to describe him uh, we play a little word game with everyone a little word association. <laughs> this will be fun I've been warned about this. It's getting around. It's getting around. And you're prepared, I see. OK. Oh, gosh. <laughs> now I am scared. What one word pops into your head when I say Scott Morrison? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> uh, um, uh, what would you say about him? What one word springs to mind when I say Scott Morrison? Bulldozer. Genuine. Ideologue. Divisive. Determined. Full throttle. Stubborn. Decent. Slippery. Look, I got on, I got on with him, so I don't want to be one of the... I'm sure you'll have many haters. I, I, I'm not one of them. Misunderstood. Patriot. Committed. Dedicated. Driven. Leader. Disappointing. He's a complex individual and I find it hard to summarise him in one word. Very controlling. Controller. Lucky. Smoke. I'll just read out a few about you. <laughs> it's quite a range. All human beings are complex. I'm no different. I mean, firstly, could you think of anything worse than having to watch all of your colleagues give one word to describe Mark Willsey? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried about that, actually. Um, and, uh, and what I thought was hilarious was that Angus Taylor even came prepared, but he still gave me three, you know. So, you know, it was interesting. Well, did it strike you, with Abbott and Turnbull, there were kind of variations of the same words, whether it was their friends or enemies, they sort of trended in the same direction. Whereas with Morrison, it was just such a vast array of different words. What did you make of that? Well, it wasn't just the, the, the words, Lee, it was also the pauses. Um, I think Andrew Bragg won the day. I think his was about 11 seconds before he got something to actually blurt out. Um, yeah, he was a guy, I think, within his own party who, who still perplexes people. Um, and some of the words weren't very nice, obviously smug. Um, others were interesting, misunderstood. Um, and the man himself, um, obviously he's got a bit of a thick skin at times. Um, I think maybe he was a bit surprised by some of the extremes that we saw. There was an absolutely beautiful bit of analysis in episode one. I, I think one of the best lines in the series delivered by Erica Betts. Does Tony Abbott dislike Malcolm Turnbull? This is a good question. I've never asked uh, Tony Abbott about that, but uh, Malcolm has this capacity. If Tony Abbott could walk on water, then Malcolm Turnbull would articulate very effectively that this was proof positive that Tony Abbott can't swim. Primo. <laughs> he delivered the line. <laughs> um, yeah, as only Erica Betts can. Um, it so, was how, so how do you then... When you know as the interviewer that you've just been bowled up an absolute piece of gold, how do you react in the moment there? You've got to show that you've appreciated that really interesting insight, but you've got to probably not laugh out loud. You've got to keep the discipline of the interview going. I, I think what that highlighted to me though, Lee, was that there were so many interesting evaluations or free character assessments, as they were called, of, of, of their colleagues. And unfortunately, we couldn't put them all in. There were just uh, some amazing stuff. Barnaby Joyce uh, gave a very interesting uh, sort of line about the difference between Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull that we didn't manage to put in. I felt the best way to explain Tony Abbott is, and I suppose Malcolm Turnbull later on is, if you fell off a boat and it was into the sea and it was full of sharks, Tony Abbott would jump in and save you. Malcolm would give a very good speech about what a wonderful person you'd been. 
<laughs> that's gold as well. Were there any other bits you were particularly fond of that had to hit the cutting room floor? Yeah, quite a bit actually, Leanne. And, and that, you know, each episode was 90 minutes, so we've got a lot of time, but we still had to cut things out. And um, I, the, the things I really enjoyed were the, the anecdotes of, again, in the room. And there was one with Craig Laundy talking about a particularly um, little brutal interaction he had in the party room with Tony Abbott. Tell me the story about you and Abbott coming together in the party room over this issue. Throughout the hours that we spent in party room that day, Tony, who was only sitting three or four metres from kept interjecting. And no one, because of his gravitas and his former Prime Minister, no one pulled him up. So I stood up and I started to give my, my thoughts and Tony interjected. And and I said, Tony, with due respect, I've sat here and listened to you interrupt people for the last three hours. I've paid you the courtesy of being quiet. I wouldn't mind if you paid me the same courtesy. And the party room was shot. Tony's got up and walked across and sat down and we had some very terse words. The opening salvo from Tony was along the lines of, how fucking dare you embarrass me in this party room. I've done nothing but support you from your pre-selection days. You've stabbed me in the back. I said, how fucking dare you come over and you talk to me like that? You fucking supported me? I said, I only got there by the skin of my teeth because of you. But as I say, to his absolute credit, you know, cooler heads prevailed. He st and it was him that extended the olive branch and, uh, and we shook hands and agreed to disagree. I mean, it's a pretty unique workplace, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and obviously there's uh, quite a rambunctious, uh, robust process in that party room. And, and what that gave us was an insight in just how heated it could get. Um, and also that I, I wonder if in other workplaces that would be tolerated, that sort of language and abuse towards each other. And, you know, it, it, it's an interesting anecdote. It didn't make the final cut, but it, it certainly gave a sense of just how tough it could get in that party room. Speaking of moments getting tough and, and you know, emotions heated and stuff, even, you know, in your own team, it must get so difficult when you've got clips that some people probably feel really strongly that that has to go in. But as you say, you've got 90 minutes, you've got so much material, it's got to be so hard. It is. And, and the Barnaby Joyce sharks analogy about Malcolm and Tony was one I was, I said to Caitlin Shea, um, who's running the show, oh, Caitlin, we've got to get that in. We've got to get that in. She said, um, she's doing a wonderful job at scripting. She's a master, as I said, and she's going, I just can't fit it in. In the end, I had to accept that. Um, and I'm just glad we've got to see it now. <laughs> Do you think that immersing in all of this gave you any particular insights into the psychology of, of politicians as a, as a group? Yeah, it, it was fascinating for me. Um, and I was also fascinated, or particularly fascinated, by the way things could turn so quickly. It's almost like, you know, throwing a drop of blood into an Amazonian river and watching the piranhas come. Um, they were brutal at times to each other. And, and I, I, I still, to this day, um, marvel at just how much that bitterness can hang over for years and years and years. And, you know, one of the, the, the most revealing moments for me is when I asked Scott Morrison to give me one word for Malcolm Turnbull. And he said, he was a friend. And I said, was? And he said, I hope you, we will be again one day. And it was, you know, wow, you know, he obviously misses that friendship. Um, I'm not sure Malcolm does, but um, yeah, so you get a glimpse at, at, at the, the bloodshed and the brutality, but you also get a sense that there is some regret and some sorrow and maybe some more human values. I mean, they're enemies, obviously, within their own party, but then they also have their political enemies on the other side. But the reality is there is only a tiny handful of people that can ever understand what it is like to do that job. Indeed, indeed. And, and Turnbull, in his interview, gave a great analogy. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and yeah, it's a tough job. And it's an even tougher job if you've got people gunning for you. And that's the thing. They, they, this never stopped for any of them, really, for th those main players. It was just on. The nature of politics as well uh, means that, you know, once you're in that top job, basically the clock ticks from the first day you get there. Because for most people, it's going to end in failure and humiliation. Either you will be dumped by your colleagues or the Australian public mm. will turf you out. And so that creates this particular um, environment, I think, of, of paranoia. Malcolm Turnbull summed it up, I thought, quite well. 
In politics, when you're talking to people about voting, particularly uh, in leadership ballots, and I've been in a lot of them, the only person on whom you can completely rely is the one that looks you in the eye and says, I would rather cut off my right arm than vote for you, you bastard. That person you can definitely put down as a no. <laughs> I mean, that strikes me as so incredible because it's not like we can walk out of here and you can march upstairs and people that you thought were your friends and who respected you, they're all standing around and they go, Mark, actually, we think your time's up and you can pack your bag and, and kind of go. I mean, what impact must that have on people's human psyche that that is your workplace environment? It does. And like you said, I think it breeds a bit of paranoia and, you know, <sighs> I suppose it also can breed complacency at times. You know, we had George Brandis saying, you know, I was warning Turnbull. I was saying, Dutton is stalking you. And so uh, maybe it does breed paranoia. Other times it might uh, breed a sense of, uh, you know, basically uh, you're invincible. Um, and I think um, you mentioned uh, you, you either go at the hands of your colleagues or the Australian people. I, I definitely got a sense, you know, having ha had a chat with Tony Abbott and from Malcolm Turnbull, it's a lot harder to go if you've been stabbed by your colleagues than it is like Morrison who's been legitimately voted out by the Australian people. So yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a hard business and uh, one that I said the bitterness still is there today. Well, particularly I guess because with your colleagues it's quite clear from this series that also sometimes people you think are your friends are the ones who are going to come and, and give you the tap. Well, that's the thing, you know, uh, we've, we've talked about friendship here, the Morrison-Turnbull friendship, the, uh, the Turnbull-Barnaby-Joyce friendship that, that dissolved over the so-called bonk ban and the rumours of the affair. Um, you know, friendships uh, that may never have existed. I, I was so surprised when David Littleproud um, just told me I've never had a relationship with Scott Morrison where I could just give him advice. And I, he talked about going to Cabargo during the fires and how much of a disaster that was for him. And yeah, so some people are never your friends and others, we did see the disintegration of a lot of friendships. The, the Cabargo situation that you mentioned, that was another reminder of while when we watch politicians, you know, as a viewer, a member of the public, they kind of seem almost like two dimensional, not quite human. You go and have an experience like that and it is a devastating experience for, for the way, you know, the, the locals received Morrison. I mean, that, that was one of those moments I feel like where the kind of humanity and the difficulty of the job really leapt out. Yeah, you can see from the pictures and we'd, we'd seen them, you know, over the course of the last few years. Um, just how unnerved Scott Morris was by that. And, and according to David Littleproud, he was thoroughly shocked and rattled by that. Now Morrison says, oh no, I, look, I was more rattled by the, the terrible stories that I was hearing and people, there were people who shook my hand there. So, you know, I have to take that. But yeah, you do get a glimpse at what it's like for the Australian people to turn on you. What kind of reaction have you had from the politicians who appeared in it and indeed from those who chose not to? I've had a couple of calls, but I have to say, Lee, the, the phone is very quiet. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's happening, really. I think maybe they just want this series to, to, to run, and it has, and we can get on with things and don't go near hear him again. I bet you the phones aren't quiet between all of them. <laughs> no. Uh, in <laughs> fact, uh, one of the few people who did ring me, um, who was in Cabinet, said that the phones were running very hot through the series. Well, it was absolutely fascinating. Mark, congratulations to you and the team. Wonderful bit of TV. Thanks, Lee.